Special shout out to all my patrons. Uh, Hello. Uh, what one would you like to discuss then? Because I've got an opinion on all of them. You can start wherever you want, dog. Um. Well, I'll just run through them and I'll just let you know briefly what, what the thesis is on it. So, trans youth deserve gender-affirming care. Correct. Probably not necessary in 99.9% .9 of cases. Trans men and men. And Wait, um, hold on, hold on. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna touch on each that you bring up. Why would you say yep, it's not necessary? It. Not ne not even that it's not necessary. I believe that it's damaging. How so? Because, I mean, you've got a society nowadays where you've got a massive population of trans people and the numbers just don't add up and it makes no sense. And there's obviously that. And I've spoke to trans people about this and they've agreed. There is a massive social element to it. You know, besides the brain scans and, you know, what, what people feel and whatnot, there's a massive social element as if it's a kind of trend. And by doing this gender affirming care, you're kind of reinforcing that. Yeah, so I would disagree with that on like every level, right? There's it's not there's no trend about being trans. It's just that we, society is more open. So trans people are more willing to come out, right? So when we look at most trans people prior to like 2010, most of them were adults. They were adults well into their 40s, some of them in their 50s. Why? Because it took them years to be accepted by society until they could come out. Now that it's more accepting, people are more able to come out at an earlier age. So instead of waiting until they're 40 and 50 and living through however many years of unhappiness, they're able to transition early and not deal with that. So I would I would I would disagree that it's become trendy. Um, I also have a feel I based on what you said, it seems like you don't fully know what gender affirming care is. Well just give me a brief overview of, of what it is then. Sure. Yeah. Gender affirming, idea, but... gender affirming care is an umbrella term. Um, it stands for basically anything that would reaffirm um, a trans person's gender. So this can be social transitioning um, and social uh, reaffirming. So um, changing your name, going by different pronouns, letting your hair grow out, wearing different clothes. And then it can be anything up to medical transition. So things such as... Uh, Puberty blockers, HRT, facial feminization surgery, top surgery, bottom surgery, uh, a whole litany of things. Um, and so, we're talking about children here. Yes, we are talking about youth, yeah. Anybody under 18. So, yeah, so to point out, the, obviously, the, the more extreme ones and that. So um, gender-affirming surgery, you believe that, that, that uh, children are suitable for that? Uh, in any case children children of what age what do you mean by children well, like, like you said youth people under 18 yeah so i don't make a delineation of what type of gender affirming care they should be or should not be getting that shouldn't be up to me that should be up to their doctor their therapist and their parents i just say we need to allow access to these gender affirming care uh because it saves their lives but you just as much as i can we can have an opinion on these things Obviously, you know, the final say would come from a doctor and, you know, their opinion really is, you know, more credible to an extent. But I'm asking you your opinion. Do you think that a child should be able to have gender affirming surgery? Uh, should they be able to have gender affirming surgery? Depends on the surgery. I think that anybody under Let's the age of top surgery having the breast removed. Yeah, example. I don't see an issue with that. Just like I would let cisgender kids have top surgery. Uh, if there was somebody who was cisgender who didn't like the size of their breasts for whatever reason, or it provided them discomfort, or it was a medical issue, yeah, absolutely, they can have they can have top surgery. If it's a medical issue, that's a different story. But well, all think... gender gender affirming care would all be medical issues because there right, are well, there are things that you're at risk for when you need them. So those would all be medical issues as well. Yeah, well, that's that's one thing we won't be able to find common ground on. But why what what makes you think that a child uh, let's just take you know uh, a 14 15 year old girl for example who's you know she's gone into puberty a few years ago she's developing breasts what makes you think that a child has you know the mental capacity to make that decision that for the rest of her life you know for the rest may possibly 80 years of her life that she's got left that she doesn't want those breasts what makes you think that at that point in her life which she's in the very very early days of it 
that she knows that that's a decision she wants to make indefinitely. Yeah, so a few things on that. A, when we look at the research on gender incongruencies, we can actually see that children as young as four years old can start to have incongruencies by based on their gender. Uh, this is studies com that come directly from the American Pediatric Association and the American Psychological Association. So these kids are already experiencing these things. Now, what services they should be getting would be determined by a therapist. So it's not on me to say, are these kids within their mental faculties? It's not on 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 a parent even i would say it's on a it's on a therapist and then they discuss treatment options now if i was a parent and it came down to do i let my kid have top surgery or do i risk my kid unaliving themselves i'm gonna go top surgery every time every time it's not even a question it's, it's, you know it's such that, an easy question how do you know that the moan unaliving themselves wouldn't be as a result of having the surgery because we have I mean, because we well. have yep because we have studies on the suicidality rate of transgender um, youth pre and post uh, gender reaffirming care. And the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, if you want specific studies, I can give them to you because I have them all. They're in the link tree in my bio. Uh, but we have the suicidality rates and they're insanely lower when after gender reaffirming care, they don't rise. But the suicide rates as a whole for transgender people is massive. So, I mean, it's the highest in, in any community. Yes, because they're not receiving this care. See, now that's that's correlation that's um correlation without causation. No, it's not. We again we have the trends here that when these children and or youth uh re receive gender affirming care, the suicidality rate drops. We have the numbers on these. But so this isn't causation. This that. isn't causation without correlation. Yeah, but a trend that I could I could unpick with that really is that, and I'm not trying to say this to be offensive in any way, but these people who, you know, identify as transgender and whatnot, they're social anomalies, you know, they've, based on what's considered normal, they're not normal. Do you know what I mean? So how do you know that I would call them atypical, I wouldn't them call them like, not normal. They might be atypical okay, because they're not atypical the typical, then. they're not the typical representation, but what does that have to do with anything? What does it matter like, whether they like are or they say, aren't? I didn't want to make... I didn't want to try and be offensive or anything, but let's call it atypical. So let's say these people have an atypical, you know, mental processing. How do you know that that's the suicide isn't as a result of that? What are you talking about? Well, what I said, I mean, you're you're saying that because they're not receiving the care, that they that they're um, you supposed to unalive in themselves, right? How do you know that it's because they've got hindered mental capacity? That, that isn't the reason why it's happening. Because being trans isn't a mental illness, according to every therapist on the planet. Uh, well, it is. I mean, it's gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria and being trans are two separate things. You can be trans without having gender dysphoria. Some cis people have gender dysphoria, right? You don't have to be trans to have it. I mean, there's always, go always going to be an element of that there because they would have, you know, they would have identified as a previous gender and they would have been confused then, so they would have had gender dysphoria. No, gender dysphoria is a very specific set of criteria that you have to meet in order to have gender dysphoria. Uh, you have to have distress over your body. So there are some trans people who have no issues with their bodies. They are fine with their bodies the way they are. Those trans people would not have gender dysphoria. Yeah, well, I, th I think for me, the problem lies when it comes to children. I mean... When I, when I was a kid, you know, you say as, as young as four years. Well, when I was as old as eight years, I was um, I asked my mum so that I could get a doll and a pram, which is obviously something that seeing that little girls do. I asked for a doll and a pram, and I played with it for about a week, and then I said, you know what, I don't want it anymore, and we took it back. Now, I worry that if a child grows up in today's society and they're in the position that I was in, and they choose to do something that's, you know, considered girly or whatever, this gender affirming care kind of reinforces that because if you've got a mum who's all for this, she's going to be like, oh, hang on, you need to go and see a doctor and, you know, that, discuss what that statement you just like made, that. like this whole this whole hypothetical you just made literally proves that you don't understand how gender affirming care works and you don't understand the steps of how you would give your kids gender affirming care. Just now, now here's here's how I'll describe it to you. Let's say you have a child and you have a and you have a girl that's been a, that's assigned girl at birth. Like this is your it's your it's your child. It's your daughter and your daughter starts showing signs that they don't like dresses. 
Now, they're not outwardly saying, hey, mom, I feel like a boy, but they're saying, I don't like wearing dresses. I really dislike it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Don't make me do it. Now, a bad parent would say, well, you're going to wear dresses either way. Wear dresses, end of story. A good parent might say, okay, this could possibly, could possibly be the start of some sort of gender incongruency. I'm going to allow my child not to wear dresses because they've expressed that want to me. And I, there's no reason for them to be forced to. And possibly in the future, that might lead them to another realization. But it's not, oh, hey, they don't want to wear dresses, so now we're going to put them in therapy. That's just not what happens. That's not how we'll any gender-affirming care happens. And anyone claiming that that's how gender-affirming care happens is lying to you. No, but that's the worry for me. Like, if I was to, you know, like I say, that situation was to happen with a child today. And, you know, even, even if the idea gets picked up that they could possibly be uh, representing traits of another gender even if the idea is picked up and they're educated on it and you know they're, they're took to therapy and it's disgust of them well how do you know that same child which would have been me would would not grow up with with these ideas because therapists the know choices? how to because they're their therapists specific specifically gender therapists know how to d distinct like they know the distinction between i just don't want to wear a dress and i'm experiencing gender dysphoria they know it. Well, there's they don't a distinction. Necessarily there. know yes, they this, do. I mean, this is a very new concept. No, it's really not. It's really well, not that new. It is really. It's, isn't it? it's genuinely it's not. We have been studying transgender people in uh, psychological settings since like the 50s. This isn't new. Well, I, w I would beg to differ, to be honest. It just based like on say, based I, on what no, you're saying. It's, it's no, not I, new based on what? I mean, it's just based on common sense. I've got absolutely no problem with wait, grown adults. Hold on, you can't like. wait. You can't say it's based on common sense when I can provide you studies of trans people from the fifties. That would instantly no, invalidate I'm based on common sense. I don't claim to be a scientist. Well, great, but everything I'm saying instantly invalidates everything you're saying. Why is that? Because mine isn't based on common sense. It's based on actual research. But there's, you know, the thing is, you can find a study for something, and then I can guarantee there'll be a study out there saying the absolute opposite. Yeah, that's why we actually have to look at the studies. We have to see whether the studies were uh, peer-reviewed studies, whether they're possible double-blind studies, depending on the type of study. We have to look at the um, conflicts of interest between the people in the study who funded the study. There's a lot of ways to know which studies are correct and which aren't. It never means they're correct. I think that's an important differentiation to make. No, there are absolutely studies that are correct over other studies. Absolutely. I mean, there's 100%. ones that are more likely to be correct, but, you know, if, if you can find anything that says anything different to that study, then it can't be correct. No, that's not how this works. That's not how research works. Why? Because it only works in your favor? No, because there is understanding studies that are done from actual medical professionals and understanding how those work and then there's going well what if i write something that disproves that well well yeah if you can provide actual proof in your study then the medical field's going to go with you they're going to they're going to say oh we're moving on this is this is accurate but if you can't provide that proof they're not going to do that that's not how studies work it's just not i mean like i say for me the problem lies when you're talking about children you know you talk about children as young as four years old being able to express you know agenda that they weren't assigned nope, at birth. That's not what I, mean, I said. That, that's not what I said they do. I said they have incongruencies with their gender. Incongruencies okay, just means that. that so incongruencies just means they show signs of aversion to certain things that are gendered. They may uh have yeah, distress. They may feel a certain nice. way. Right? Hey, thank you for the sub. Uh but it does not mean that they're instantly trans because they might not be they might be gender non-conforming they might need be they might be uh non-binary they might be uh whatever whatever but that doesn't instantly mean that oh these are trans women or trans men or trans girls or trans boys there are multiple things they could be because gender is on a spectrum and gender can work its way in like a lot of different ways so this idea that we don't wreck that we that like all of a sudden, we're going to disagree with what major medical fields are saying. It's just preposterous to me. So you're saying, right, this is what I can't get my head around. You're saying gender is a social construct, right? And you're saying a four-year-old can be non-binary. 
well, how can a four year old be non binary, which is a self which is a social construct, if they don't even understand that social construct? What? Just because you don't right. understand something doesn't mean you don't fall into that fall into that I don't fully understand what cancer is. It doesn't mean that I won't have if I get cancer, no, I don't no, have no, cancer. No, 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 no. But listen to me. The important differentiation to make is that you're saying gender is a social construct. Social so in and order cultural. to partic- say again. Social and cultural. Yeah. All right. In order to participate in that, you have to understand it. Just as much as chivalry. You know, like, you know, men being gentlemen and whatnot. That's a social construct. Now, you have to you have to understand the social construct in order to participate in it. No, you don't. You do. No, you because don't. It's, like you say, it's a, it's a social construct. Wait, it's do not you think, anything do you biological. Think, wait, hold on, hold on. Do you think that the children of slaves understood the social constructs of race and slavery? No, but they were still slaves, right? No, but they right? understood the suffering. Yeah, and kids as young as four understand when they have incongruencies with their gender. I don't understand what's no, hard they for you. Do, they, yes, they do. Yes, they do. I, I you can claim you can claim with that. I don't care that you disagree. The science doesn't. Four year olds. How how can you even how can you even take that information that a four year old Yeah, if a four year old little girl refuses to wear dresses and says, I don't like wearing dresses, they make me feel bad. Putting these on doesn't make me feel okay. That's an incongruency with their gender. If a four-year-old little girl says, I don't like growing my hair out long. I like keeping it short. It makes me feel okay. Growing it out doesn't feel good. That's a gender incongruency. If a four-year-old little boy says, no, I, I not having my nails painted. I like painting my nails. Please let me paint them. Please let me paint them. It feels good to paint them. That's an incongruency with their gender. If you don't understand what gender incongruency is, that's fine, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No, but on the other side of the coin, all you kind of people would say that all those things are gender neutral and that and that I could paint my nails and still be, you know, a man. Yeah, you could, but unfortunately, they're unfortunately, socially, they really aren't gender neutral things just yet. Dresses are still gendered towards women. Long hair is still gendered typically towards women. So let's let's not play tongue in cheek like we like we've hit a point where we've abolished gender roles because we haven't. No, of course we haven't. I mean, they'll always be there. That is biological, I believe. Gender roles are not biological. They're social. I, no, I believe it is because, you know, you put everyone into a survival situation. You know, let's say we had World War Three. Everyone would soon go back to the biological gender roles. They soon would. There's the men no would such. Be no, hold on. This is how I can prove this is how I can prove you wrong. So indigenous tribes, right? We're not set up mm-hmm. this way. Indigenous tribes did not exist where men would hunt and women would stay at home. What would happen is men and women both would hunt and gather while the elders would stay at back and watch the kids. So these are people who didn't have an influence from Western society. They just, you know, evolved based on their indigenous uh, tribes and the way they work. And they did not have traditional gender roles. Traditional gender roles are almost a, a, almost specifically a Western Judeo-Christian mindset. No, I would have, yes. I would have to disagree with that. Based on what? Based on common sense. It's not common. I just gave you evidence, okay, to why you're not correct. And your response is based on common sense but it's not evidence though is it yes it is evidence no it's not anecdotal you're claiming that society wait you're claiming that society hold on hold on you're claiming that society would revert back to gender roles of like men being hunters and protectors and women being nurturers and staying in the in like uh caregivers yet when presented with society that was not influenced by western judeo-christian society right our Western Judeo- Judeo-Christian uh, culture, these societies did not work that way. That completely well, I mean, only, invalidates you, your claim. You only have to look as far as the psychology to see that women are more nurturing, men are more it's not dominant. True. You know? It's not no, true. It's not true. No, it's literally not. Yeah, absolutely. It is not. The, psych- the psychology is clear as day. There is no actual psychology based on that. There is. No, so there's not. The reason why right now, the reason why right now, 
women would be considered more nurturing is because we forced them into the box of nurturer and for almost all of Western society have forced women to take up those roles. It wasn't until recently in society that we allowed them to even have jobs. So yes, if we want to look at that, it's because they've been socially conditioned, but that's not nature. That's us conditioning them to be one way or another. This is basic psychology that all of this stuff, like it's it's so, if you take one sociology class, they will disprove you on all of this. Just one sociology well, class is all you need. Well, no, but what, what if you look at as far as animals, for example, you know, it's always the mother who's caring. Who cares the for the young, uh, wait, who dude. hunts, who hunts in a pack of lions? What do you mean? Who hunts? It's the male. No. Male lions don't do the hunting. Yeah, they do. No, they don't. You they what? Did. No, they don't. Hold on, let me just search this up. It's going to mute me. This is the easiest Google search. Lionesses are the primary hunters. <laughs> bro, this is first grade, bro. What's up, Hannah? What's up? I only have a few minutes because I'm busy right now, but Ooh. just needed to jump in on this ridiculousness. <laughs> right, so I've had a look. So females typically hunt when they don't have newborn to care for. Now, when there's newborn in the equation, it's the males that go out and hunt, and the females stay home and nurture. Yeah, the, the, female, the female lions hunt 90% of the time. But the point that you missed out is that I was talking about children, right? And I I put that analogy to wait. To the lions, only reason example. wait the only reason why the female lions don't go out and hunt when they have kids is because they're breastfeeding. That's the only reason. Nurturing exactly. No, wait, I wouldn't call that nurturing. Doesn't prove your claim. Well, that's exactly that's just what they do. Natural the biological the function of females. That the I can male see we're not getting do. anywhere. So the male, anyway, so the female is off. The female, I, I is forced to care for, the female is forced to care for the young because the male biologically can't. Yeah. He can't know. This is what always happens. When a woman comes in and opens her mouth, they get so defensive like he just did. It's ridiculous. Imagine not knowing that female lions do the hunting. Imagine thinking that there's a biological factor in women being more nurturing. Insane. Just a thought. Also, like you can literally, even if you just like look it up, like just a quick Google search, it will literally tell you that the only reason women report being more nurturing is because of social the socialization process. So, it Hold one so right. one sociology class, one one sociology class, just a single one. 